Last Friday, I went to a dinner party and our host asked if I could guide a conversation around a common theme. So I picked a question from my favorite questions from my new card game. What piece of advice would you give your 18 year old self? And there were all sorts of answers. One woman remembers feeling hopeless at 18 and is now a major international figure. It's only now that she can tell her 18 year old self that it's not over when you think it's over and when you feel trapped. She told us about the circumstances of her life at 18 without which we could not understand the advice that she was giving herself. So obviously she told us the story of her life. And some of us would like to tell our 18 year old selves that things will change. And some of us would like to tell our 18 year old self to be more careful. And others would tell our 18 year old self to be more carefree. And one 18 year old wants to hear, go for it. And another one wants to hear, you don't have to do it all. But all in all, it was very clear. You can't give advice to your 18 year old self without talking about the context of who you were at 18 and where you were at. And this is why we have stories. We all have our go-to stories, but have you ever wondered what role they play in your life? Some stories we tell ourselves embolden us. Some stories keep us trapped. How might our internal logic of these stories shape your new experiences? Today's workshop is all about how the stories we tell ourselves can make or break us. But first, hi everyone. Thank you for joining me at Letters from Esther Live, my monthly workshop series to help you reflect, act, and develop greater confidence and relational intelligence in all your relationships. This series happens monthly on YouTube and Facebook Live. For more letters from Esther Perel, visit estherperel.com slash blog. And I invite you to join us every month here on YouTube and on Facebook to discuss the newsletter live. But before we start, one, consider reaching out to one person who you know may benefit from joining us for this workshop, the stories we tell ourselves and how they can make and break us. As always, I encourage you to take notes in a notebook dedicated to these workshops or to put it anywhere else, pen and paper, so that you can have your track for how you are developing your relational intelligence. And if you like to what you're learning today, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It even has rhythm. You can find the buttons that follow right below the video. This month, storytelling has been the theme throughout, across all the channels, in the newsletter, on the blog, and on social media. Why? Why stories? Because our stories help us make sense of our reality. Our stories connect us to others. Through our stories, we experience our memory. They help us understand our past, what we've been through, who we were then, who we are now, and who we could be and would like to be going forward. Through stories, we establish the similarities that we feel with others. And through stories, we connect with people who are vastly different from us. Love is a story. Heartbreak is a story. Our memories are stories. When we are born, one of the first things we do is listen to people who tell us stories. Stories bring the world to us through bedtime stories. They regale us. A good story is hypnotic, absorbing, and it's why we read novels. I remember some of the childhood stories that I wanted people to read to me over and over again. They helped me make sense of the world, understand people, understand characters, understand why, what, how, and when, the basic foundation of how we grasp reality. Stories find us 
while we get lost in them. Stories find us while we get lost in them. And as many of us are experiencing again now, we tell stories to introduce ourselves to new people as we reemerge from a long lockdown and pandemic isolation. And we are once again connecting and reconnecting. As a traveler, you always meet people who tell you travel stories. When you're interested in art, people tell you of the latest exhibit or the shows that they've been seeing and the artists that they've discovered. That's a story. All of social media is storytelling and it's often quite intimate. It's also very curated, very filtered, and sometimes the story is a lie or at least in some way. And sometimes then the story supersedes the truth. We all have our version of this, and this is really our focus today. So, on Instagram stories, we asked you all the following questions, and the polling results were really interesting. So feel free to answer right now in the chat as well. For those of you who are just joining us now, exercise those questions with us. They are great practice. Have you ever caught yourself? making unfair assumptions about somebody else. Unfair assumptions are a story. 94% of you said yes. <clears throat> have, uh, has a childhood of neglect made you question whether you are worthy of attention and love? That too is a story. 74% of you said yes. Have one too many bad dates made you give up on dating altogether? This one was almost split evenly. 43% of you said yes, and 57% of you said no. Do you often find yourself explaining why you are the way that you are to someone who interprets your story as an excuse? 63% of you said yes. So for everyone who answered any of these, it's time to ask, what if you're actually trapped in your own story? What if you're actually trapped in your own story? It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that the way you remember it isn't what was or that the story doesn't matter. It may all be true, but how does it serve you? Let's revisit the last question because this one is a major one and it gets to the core of what this workshop is about. Do you often find yourself explaining why you are the way you are to someone who interprets your story as an excuse? Basically, have you ever found yourself telling a story to explain your behavior, even to someone who's known you for a very long time? Have you ever been on the receiving end of that? For example, sometimes I hear partners, one partner say to the other, I can't bear watching you cry because it makes me feel like I am personally responsible, like I did something wrong. And that brings me right back to how responsible I felt when I was in what when I felt like I held the emotional labor in my house growing up. And I think we've all experienced some version of this in our relationships and even in our friendships. Sometimes we listen to the stories of others and they clarify, they illuminate, they explain why they do what they do and what may be underneath this. And sometimes we listen to the stories of others and we really see clearly that they are trapped in a narrative that may be hurting them. I am not your family. We are not in the past. You are not needing to be responsible for me. I just want the permission to be upset without your feeling that you have to do something immediately to make it go away, to fix it, which then in fact doesn't make me feel like you're giving me the permission to express my feelings, but that you're shutting me down because you feel too guilty and too responsible and too agitated by my distress. That's a story. That's a relationship story. 
Sometimes the story that someone else is trapped is actually hurting us too. That's what I'm saying. In the end, I feel like you're basically telling me, don't cry because I can't handle it. And I can't handle it because of what happened to me way back when. That becomes a story that I then feel as constricting to me. And, you know, sometimes one person says, because my brother stole my toys, I can steal from others. Because I'm independent, I don't need anybody else. Because I have no time in the day, I'm always late. Stories. These are all stories. And then our own narratives, when we hear this, often will clash. And we think people who steal are morally corrupt. Or you say you don't need anybody because you don't want to be disappointed. <laughs> That's very different than you don't need anybody because you are also independent. Sure, you may be busy, but you're always late because you're a flake. And when you flake on me, I take it as a sign that you don't care and don't respect me and my time. So, why do we tell ourselves stories, even stories that don't serve us? Everybody walks around, by the way, with preconceived scripts about what things mean and why they may happen. This is fact. This is just part of our social, being a social animal, a social being. And even though it sometimes keeps us stuck, the stories that we tell ourselves have important purpose. The first purpose is that these stories are often reminders and often act as protection and prevention. What do I mean? So many of our core stories, such as I can't depend on anybody but myself, were once adaptive responses to a terrible life plot. We didn't come up with these, with these stories with, for no reason. The story was an adaptive response to a lesser than good situation. They banished our helplessness and made us able and strong. I don't need anybody. If I can't depend on anyone, I better think that I can't, that I don't need anyone. That way I don't have to deal with my dependence and my disappointment and my helplessness. I start to think of myself as strong and self-reliant and I can handle it all myself. But while they fit in the past, these stories don't actually fit in the present and they may be blocking the future. Holding on to them with tenacity can make us hypervigilant, unable to trust, unable to connect, unable to experience closeness and intimacy and see because we see the past everywhere. So it's easy to say, be in the present, be focused. But in fact, it demands that we kind of go through the weeds of all these stories that sometimes cloud our ability to see the present rather than experience it in the same way as we used to experience the past. What we insist on persists. And if we can stop from seeing it, and it not if we can stop, this stops us from seeing and trying new things, and yes, writing new stories. New behaviors, new stories. New interactions, new stories. If a date shows up late and we have a history of being left waiting and feeling invisible, we might race immediately to the foregone conclusion of our go-to story, that either they are selfish or that we are not worthy or both. And when we hold on to these deep beliefs, about who we are and how we think others view us, it prevents us from creating new beliefs about who we can be. And if I'm on the receiving end of that misassumption, it hurts me too. This is the important thing. It doesn't just hurt the, the eye of the beholder. But don't worry, writing new stories isn't just about letting go of the hero's journey that has led us to where we are now. It's about allowing ourselves to write new pages, new sentences, new chapters, to develop plot, to develop a new plot, characters, themes, settings, and lessons. The writing is rich, really rich. Writing our story 
we can edit it constantly and add and refine and delete all these beautiful things that become part of the creative act of our agency, of our, our life. So how do you know when you are trapped in a story? That's a very important question. I deal with that in the practice all the time. I was asked recently, how do I know when someone is stuck in a self-defeating story? And this happens in my psychotherapy office, on my podcast, even when I play with people on the new card game, I see where people express stuckness. Sometimes I hear them write an intake letter with exactly the same words, the same examples, the same descriptives as the one that they then come in and tell me. But word for word, sometimes they tell a story and I've heard it word for word exactly in the same way. So when I'm asked, what is the goal of therapy in the first session? What is the goal of a first session in therapy is more, more actually accurate here. I would say it's, there are two things that always stand up for me. One is to establish a relationship, to connect, to make an alliance with the person or with the couple. Without that, there is no therapy. We have to explore if there is a fit. A fit between me and the people that I work with is a story. And two, it's to make sure that when people come in with one story, at the end of the session, they leave with at least pieces of a new story. And a new story that also breeds hope. You come in with one script and you leave with another, or at least the possibility of another. The goal is to transform from being stuck to movement, from repetition to possibility, from feeling defeated to openness. You know, I did a, a recording for uh, an episode of season five of Where Should We Begin, my podcast. And so it's not out. So I can just tell you because it happened this week. And it was a fascinating moment. It was an interracial gay couple in which one of the partners was very clear that um, he, the, the central figure of his life had been his violent dad that he did not want to be alike. And that when they had an argument or when they had a fight, he would instantly say, this ain't never gonna work. I'm out of here. I can't handle this. I'm not made for this. Maybe I'm not, don't have the skills for being close. The story he had told himself is that his trigger point, his soft spot, his vulnerability lay, laid around his dad. But in fact, because of the violence of his dad, he had left with his mom and he basically took care of his mom since he's 12 years old. And mom has not always been very responsible. And so when the partner would say, I want to connect, not when they were fighting, when he would say, I want to connect, he instantly felt like somebody is there to suck the life out of him and wants to be taken care by him and needs him. And he doesn't want that. And then I introduced that maybe the central figure in his life wasn't just that. That was an easy one he always had been able to see front and center. But mom, who he adored and who he was so tight to, who he couldn't begin to see what may be frayed in their connection because he needed her so much. But in fact, she needed her just as much, if not more so, may be the central character. And that when he says, you're sucking the life out of me, he actually was talking to mom. And then we set up a whole psychodrama in the session with mom present in an empty chair where he spoke to her about the burden of love about how love for him was tied with responsibility, with worry, with anxiety for her well-being, with, with, with burden, and how that made it so much more difficult then to be able to respond to the wishes, the desires, the needs, the longings of his partner. That was coming in with one story and leaving with another. From talking about the violent dad, we ended up talking about the more needy mom and how those different dynamics had affected him. So I always tell people, write often and edit well. That is true for relationships and relationships are often what makes up the story of our life. So what do I mean by that? That we're not in control of how life unfolds, but we have agency over how we structure and interpret it. 
And those new interpretations help us get unstuck and give us the freedom to make adult choices that we couldn't make when we were kids. New stories liberate us from defeating memories and predetermined thinking and foregone conclusions. They create hope and possibility for change. A new story opens up the passageways of a deeper breath, fresh air, new breathing, expansion, filling up, connecting to life. So I want to give you a take-home exercise. As we get to the end of today's workshop, I leave you with a few take-home prompts to answer on your own. So listen carefully, read it. These are prompts that are designed to help you create new scripts and to edit old ones. How does anxiety talk to you? When anxiety speaks to you, what does it say? How does it say it? What does it want you to believe? How does it block you? How does it influence your interactions with others? How does anxiety talk to you? Two. What is the dialogue between the part of you that fears the worst and the part of you that dreams about more? What is that dialogue like between the constriction and the expansion, between the fear and the boldness and the possibility? Three, what do you say to yourself when you give yourself permission to try something new? What do you say to yourself to give yourself the permission to try something new? How does that voice speak to you? That's a story. That's a new story. Say something to the person who still looks at you with the eyes of the past and doesn't see all the changes that you've made. This is a constant situation. You meet people and they still talk to you as if you're still that 16-year-old when you're 45 or 32 or whatever. You know, this idea that you know, they, they don't see you with the passage of time. If you wrote the story of your life up to this point, what would the chapters be named? Just a few of the main titles of the chapters of your life. Sometimes they are connected to, till age X, I lived with both my parents, then came the divorce. We lived in this country, then we moved. We lived in this economic situation, then we had a very different economic situation. My mother was healthy, my mother got sick. I mean, these are clear different chapters of our lives. So what are your chapter titles? And as always, I thank you for joining me. Subscribe, come back, connect, and come play the game with me. Thanks, everybody. Bye.